Donald Trump has now been a convicted of 34 counts. They got what they wanted. They wanted to change his name. His name on his driver's license has been Donald John Trump. Now he will be introduced in every cable broadcast as convicted felon Donald Trump. He has a new prefix to his name. Now we've talked about for quite some time that this is a banana republic. You hear people saying that on television. We are now a banana republic. What exactly does that mean? Well, just a few months ahead of the national election in 2021, Nicaragua, the police arrested seven opposition leaders within a single week, all of them for the vague crime of acting against the independence, sovereignty, and auto-determination of the country. In response, Biden and the Biden administration slapped sanctions on the Nicaraguan regime for this anti-democracy maneuver. Did you know that in early 2021, Georgian police dragged opposition leader Nika Milia out of his party headquarters in a violent raid? The case against Malia was rooted in allegations that he incited violence during street protests by his government against the, by his supporters against the government. Does that sound familiar? Do you know that the U.S. State Department complained that arresting Malia in Georgia needlessly raised political tensions in a divided country? At the end of 2022, the left-wing government of Bolivia arrested Luis Fernando Camacho, the right-wing governor of the country's largest state, on charges of terrorism, stemming from his support for 2019 protests that toppled the country's then-leader, Evo Morales. Camacho has remained in prison ever since, though the Biden State Department didn't say much, it's because Camacho is a conservative. In 2016, Ugandan presidential candidate Kiza Besigye was arrested on election day and was subsequently charged with treason for encouraging illegal protests and challenging the legitimacy of Uganda's election results. The United States did not like this at all. Quote, the United States condemns the detention of opposition presidential candidate Kizia Bazigi while voting and tallying is going on. Such an action calls into question of Uganda's commitment to a transparent and free election process, free of, from intimidation. State Department spokesman John Kirby told reporters. When we say banana republic, we are talking about these third world countries that do not have the system that we have here. Now, I was not surprised when I saw the news yesterday. And so I said, okay, we expected this. What was fascinating to see, and I suppose this is one of the only silver linings, is the amount of people that were contacting me that are not Trump fans, that do not care for his politics, and they're angry, they're upset, and they say, what country are we living in? And my answer is, well, where have you really been the last couple of years? This is just yet another chapter in the book of the takeover, the hostile ruling class takeover of this country. You see, the way that our system of justice should operate is that picture of Lady Liberty. It should be blind. That idea is that no one is above the law and that no one should be below the law, meaning that you should equally apply justice regardless of who you are. Now, I would not get too fired up today if Donald Trump was convicted by a jury of his peers for, I don't know, flying on Lolita Express to a mysterious Caribbean island with a financier named Jeffrey Epstein spending time with underage girls. I wouldn't get fired up, nor would you, if Donald Trump started a family foundation and funneled hundreds of millions of dollars of money from foreign adversaries for his own political war chest. I wouldn't get fired up if Donald Trump was convicted by a jury of his peers because as vice president of the United States, he was selling foreign policy for cash acting as a prostitute so that his cokehead son could act as a international money launderer for his crime family. I wouldn't get too fired up if he was convicted by a jury of his peers for orchestrating a coup against another sitting president using the FBI, the FISA court, Carter Page, and a dirty dossier to go after political dissidents. But of course, those things are off limits. Those are not allowed 
to ever be put into a, a rule of a court of law. Instead, Donald Trump is now a convicted felon for a documents falsifying business charge case. What actually is his crime? And we must be morally clear about this. His crime is that he wanted this country to get back to greatness. The crime is that he was successful in leading an American revival. His crime is that he is a class traitor. His crime is that he was supposed to be one of them. He was supposed to be like all the other New York billionaires. He was supposed to be like Robert De Niro, toting the party line. Donald Trump was supposed to do what he was supposed to do. Say the thing, go to the charity, write the check. If Donald Trump was still doing The Apprentice, and doing real estate deals, he would not be indicted anywhere. Nobody except Donald Trump would be indicted for this. He was a successful president for four years. And the warning shot that Donald Trump ignored, and he needs unbelievable credit for his courage and his conviction and his fortitude, was when they raided his home at Mar-a-Lago. When they raided his home at Mar-a-Lago, that was the warning shot. That was the salvo. That was, you sure you want to do this? You sure you want to run for re-election? Because we control the lawfare systems in this country. You see, the Democrat Party and the regime, they had a plan. And the plan was that we were going to throw all this lawfare at Donald Trump. We're going to turn him into a convicted felon and change his name to convicted felon Donald John Trump. This will lower his approval ratings. He's going to have a bitter primary with Ron DeSantis and Joe Biden will waltz to re-election. Yesterday was not a conviction of Donald Trump. Yesterday was a conviction of the American legal system. And it's not just the New York legal system. I don't like when people say that. People are going on TV and they say, oh, what a dark day for the New York legal system. It's not just that. It is national legal pundits and scholars, some of whom are going on television celebrating what is happening, like Norm Eisen and Weissman, because they are so afraid of you. You're supposed to do what you're told. You're supposed to just watch football, drink beer, passively vote here and there, and not challenge their adventurous foreign wars. Not ask why 3.5 million people are waltzing into your country. You're not supposed to ask the question of why your kids can't afford a home. You're not supposed to believe that America can get back to greatness, that our best days are ahead, that our strength is in our people. And Donald Trump brings all of you into the room and he challenges the consensus of that ruling class. And that is his crime. It's not about falsifying business records. It's not not, not about Michael Cohen. It's not about Stormy Daniels. What was yesterday, happened yesterday, was an attempted judicial assassination. And as I go through the details of what a banana republic is, this is not the country we grew up in. And the Democrats are perfectly fine with it because they've never actually loved this country. They've always hated this country. When Barack Hussein Obama, a couple days from becoming president, says, we are a couple days away from fundamentally transforming America, you are now living in that fundamental transformation. When Barack Obama or Michelle Obama said, I've never been proud to be an American in my life as a black woman, you are now seeing that they've never had gratitude for this nation. And it explains why they're okay turning us into Bolivia, Nicaragua, Uganda, or Haiti. Because they've never loved this country. They have bitterness for it. And they see Donald Trump as a true threat, because he is a threat. He is an existential threat to their regime. Because he brings you, the American people, into the fight. It is a tipping point. Yesterday is a day unlike any other. It will go down in the memory of the nation like the JFK assassination, like 9-11, it'll go down like the 2008 financial crisis, like COVID, it'll go down like the 2016 election. You will remember where you were on May 30. Ben Burkwam is with us now. President Trump just wrapped up that historic speech after the most uh, historic injustice trial you've ever seen in America. Um, I've got Cynthia Hughes with me. She's the founder of American Freedom Project or Patriot Freedom Project. I'm going to walk outside, though. I'm going to walk and talk. So you talk about injustice. This has been going on since before January 6th when President Trump was in office. But I want to walk outside and just show you this. And I'm going to talk to Cynthia as we go. If you'll come out, just 
Check this out, Charlie. As we walk out of Trump Tower, just an incredible sight here. What the enemy meant for evil, God is going to wow. use for good. Look at the crowd. It stretches all the way around Trump Tower. We're going to walk and head out here. Patriots from across America coming in to support President Trump because they see, they see this for what it is, Charlie. They see the injustice for what it is. Absolutely incredible sight here, Charlie. That, that is unbelievable. That, that is in downtown they, New York. They've got this street and, blocked and, off. Downtown New York. Go ahead, Charlie. Now, so I, I'm curious, uh, again, those are all the paid protesters from the uh, Soros organizations, it looks yeah, like. Yeah, See how these they have are, all their the coordinated losers. signs? Look at that. The left no, no, that's losers. all coordinated. No, you should, yeah. so, so, Ben, you should go up to one of them and ask them, what does your sign say? They don't know. They were given a sign by somebody. You should go up to some of them uh, later on in the program. Make sure you film it. Say, hey, what does your sign say? Just, like, curious. Uh, like, who, do you look at, these people don't even know what they're protesting. What? what? What, what's he guilty of? Trump is guilty. What's he guilty of? Trump is guilty. What was his crime? 34 felony earning. accounts, 54 to go. What, what were those crimes? Guilty. Trump is guilty. Election sweet. interference and business fraud. You mean, you, and you said it, Charlie. The Election same people, interference. Charlie, by the way, by the way, Charlie, these are the people, these are the people that don't care that Hillary Clinton... Barack Obama and Joe Biden were using the CIA and FBI not. to collude to undermine President Trump. While while this well, was no. happening, while this garbage was happening, these are the same people that don't care about that. Hang, hang on, hang on one second, Ben. That's we'll, we'll go back to you here. You, you, yeah, no, I know. I, I think it's quite interesting here. Uh, we'll be right back. Donald Trump's donation portal crashed yesterday. He raised a record. I was thinking to myself, okay, what, what number is he going to bring in? I mean, I know a little bit about political fundraising. I was like, boy, if he does 15 million, that would be unbelievable. And I said to Erica, I said, you know, he might, you know, he might eclipse 20 million. According to his campaign, they've raised $39 million. The question is how many donors? And I want them to come out with that number. I'm very curious. What is the average donation? And if he raises $50 million, that is a serious war chest. Boom. And now we need the action plan and we are putting together the action plan. And the grassroots energy was unbelievable. The people that are coming out of the woodwork that are committing capital, by the way, at Turning Point Action, uh, we raised about a million dollars yesterday for ballot chasing and hiring new people in the grassroots, full-time people. And that's all working in, in harmony for canvassing and for doors. And look, the very important thing that we must understand that we must realize is that Genesis 50:20, as Ben Burkwam said, what the enemy meant for evil, God will use for good. So the question is, will this end up being a positive or a negative? It is wholly dependent on us. It is wholly dependent on what we do. What are we going to do this weekend? Are we going to go wear our MAGA hats in public? Oh, yeah. When you go to the grocery store, when you pick up your laundry, when or you're dry cleaning, when you go out to a restaurant, when you go pick your kids up at soccer practice, or are you just going to cower in fear and hope it gets better? Every American patriot needs to fly the Trump flags this weekend, fly the American flags. And if you fly the flag, it really should be flown in distress because this is a distress signal. You find the low propensity voters and you register them to vote. I'm getting out into the streets this weekend and we're going to find as many people as possible. We're going to register them to vote at tpaction.com slash vote. It's time to step up. This country will not be saved as a spectator sport. Okay, let's go to Ben Burkwam. I think he's unmuted. Ben, what's going on? Hey, yeah, sorry, Charlie. That was my t that was my mistake this time. But I did. I just heard you. I changed my hat. Uh, this is. I actually received this from a woman from China who escaped the CCP, who's standing up here in America, an American patriot. Now, I just want to give you a perspective. We were just over across the street with those crazy radical leftists that don't want President Trump just in jail. They want him dead. But they they occupy. There's about 30 of them over there. But you compare that 
to the sidewalks here and the sidewalks on this side, and they wrap around the side, they wrap around the buildings. Patriots in New York City standing up for President Trump. It is absolutely incredible. I want to start with Cynthia, and then we're going to walk down into that crowd. Cynthia, you were in there with President Trump, what he just said. Talk to me about this. Does this strengthen your resolve? And then also your fight with the uh, uh, Patriot Freedom Project, with all of the January 6ers. Talk to me about the, the significance and the, the similarities. Well, I mean, he's he's the newest political prisoner. He's the newest person that's uh, been convicted of political persecution, right? I mean, we've been watching this for January 6 cases for more than three years. Um, my nephew is one of them. He was politically persecuted. He spent three years in prison, 14 months in solitary confinement. This, this, what we're watching, this is the highest weaponization of government we've ever seen. President Trump and anybody that supports him or follows him is public enemy number one. Public enemy number one. There's nothing that's going to stop these people. But you heard President Trump. He's going to continue to fight. He's rock solid. He doesn't break a sweat. He looked great. He sounded great. Yeah. Uh, for somebody who was just convicted on 34 counts of garbage, okay, uh, he must have got a good night's sleep and put his head on a, a soft pillow. pillow. My you know? pillow, probably. That's right. That's right. And so, you know, well, uh, they're, they're still arresting people for January 6th. It's almost four years right. later. And they're not going to stop. This is going to continue until the election. Thank you, Cynthia. Yeah, and the here. website is? So PatriotFreedomProject.com. PatriotFreedomProject.com. All right, Patriot. Charlie. Yep, Charlie, go ahead. Charlie. So, so no, we, we got to get up to a, uh, we have a break here, but this is very important, everybody. This is now us. Only us can stop them. We can stop them. It, it's, it, th there is going to be no like savior that's going to come down. It's going to be we the people. The founding fathers gave us the greatest political document ever written in the U.S. Constitution. And Alvin Bragg just took a metaphorical steaming dump on the Constitution these last couple of weeks. It's disgusting. And I want that visual in your mind, because that's exactly what they did. They hate the Constitution. They hate the founding fathers. You know, it's interesting. I bet President Trump slept better than I did. I did, I did not sleep well last night. I usually am a very, very good sleeper. You know why? I just, I kept on going in my mind. I know what this means. I know what this means. And you know what it means. Uh, we've never lived through a day like this. For the, the closest thing to this is the successful JFK assassination. Now, they tried to shoot Reagan. They did. He's hospitalized. They tried to kill Ford, who shot at in downtown San Francisco. They did kill Bobby Kennedy. They killed Malcolm X. They killed MLK. But this is of the same genre. This was a political, legal assassination attempt. And we will see if it ends up being successful, if it is ultimately successful. Whether or not it's ultimately successful is based on our agency and what we do. And that starts with public displays of support. It starts with whether or not we are willing to do the work. And it's easy and it's tempting to say, oh, America's best days are behind us. Or what if we use this as we are at our bottom and this is a reference point and we are now going to rebuild the country, to revitalize this republic? I want to go to a couple pieces of tape here. I think it's very important. Democrats are celebrating this. This is how Donald Trump has responded to this. Donald Trump has responded to this by we will demolish the deep state. And this is why when some of these people say, oh, you know, I don't love Trump. I'm voting RFK. So get your act together here. OK, unless you're a flaming left left winger, which RFK is, you got, you got to start wising up here. Enough of this, you know, playing games. You know, I want to try to have the perfect political candidate customized because I'll, get over it. Get over the COVID stuff. Get over the vaccine stuff. I'm not a fan of that stuff either. This is warfare. OK, stop. Stop acting cute by half. You got to get on the team. You got to get on the program. You got to get on the train. You're on the tracks or you're on the train. And we got to reclaim this country. It's very simple. Go to cut 165. The final battle, with you at my side, we will demolish the deep state. We will expel the warmongers from our government. We will drive out the globalists. We will cast out the communists, Marxists, and fascists. We will throw off the sick political class that hates our country. We will rout the fake news media, and we will liberate America from these villains once and for all.
That's his response. He doesn't give up. He doesn't surrender. He doesn't give in. You know how tempting it is all of a sudden to capitulate? You got me. I'm a convicted felon. A lesser man would give in. This is a declaration of war, cultural war, against the MAGA movement. I cannot repeat this enough. You must stay peaceful. November is your pressure release valve. November is the chance where we get to combine the voices of this nation and to send the message. Don't take the bait. There are feds in every group chat trying to get you to be violent. Resist it, reject it, call them a fed and move on. Stay peaceful, stay constructive, chase ballots, register voters, become a precinct committeeman. Play cut 172. All the people that have gone out there against the mainstream media and said, you're going to call us racist, you're going to call us potential Timothy McVeigh's, f*** you. War. It's a question of attitude. It's a question of what resolve are we going to have focused resolve for such a time as this? And the stakes just got higher because they know what he represents. They hate you so much. You are such a threat. This was never part of the game. This was supposed to be Jeb Bush v. Hillary Clinton 2016. It was supposed to be two guys, a guy and a gal that agree on open borders, invading the world, and they disagree on tax policy and school, school vouchers. This was supposed to be Nikki Haley v. Biden in 2024 or something of that. It's supposed to be a ruling class party and okay, they disagree on corporate stuff and they disagree on entitlement programs, but we are in harmony on the big stuff. Donald Trump is hated and is now a convicted felon because he is right on the big stuff. You do not get in trouble for lying in this country. You get in trouble for telling the truth repeatedly. A country that we grew up in would never do this. You would never go after an opposition president who is leading in the polls on a made up document thing and no one can even tell you what the crime is. Stephen Miller joins us now. He's the founder of America First Legal. Stephen, your reaction to this heavy, sad day that we are living through. Well, everything you said, of course, is true. The America that we know and love or that we knew and love doesn't exist anymore and hasn't, frankly, in some time, but it's only becoming clear and obvious to people now that this is true. The Marxist left took over the institutions of law, the corporate press, our financial institutions, our banking institutions, and of course, our prosecutor's offices, our AG's offices, Maine Justice, CIA, FBI, all of the hard power centers in this country and the soft power centers, so the people that can control both narrative and the people can actually take away your freedom. And now what we're seeing in Manhattan with this communist show trial is the culmination of that effort. <clears throat> and I would note, very importantly, that this has gone down into the minds of the rank-and-file left-wing activist and voter in this country. So the far-left citizens who live in Manhattan, if they're impaneled on a jury, they consider it their fundamental duty as leftists to convict what they see as the enemy. There's, the evidence doesn't matter. The facts don't matter. And the right still hasn't internalized this. They haven't internalized the fact that a leftist sees their job as punishing their enemy, and they will follow those orders, and they will execute those orders faithfully every time. Whereas you put conservatives on a jury, you get a conservative judge and a conservative jury, and, and this hypothetically, oh, they would say they were sitting in judgment of Hunter Biden. So let's say you, Hunter Biden was on trial um, in, say, Mobile, Alabama. <clears throat> they would bend over backwards to be fair. And it doesn't, it's not specific to any, Alabama, any conservative jurisdiction to be fair. The, the left sees their job as wielding power, control. And until the right wakes up to this fact and acts on it, 
that we're going to continue losing and the whole movement, frankly, is going to get pulverized because the left keeps seeing they get away with it all. Throw life protesters in prison, no problem. Spy on your enemies, no problem. Shut down their free speech, censor them, deplatform them, no problem. Hillary Clinton wants to uh, purchase a dirty foreign dossier, no problem. James Comey wants to lead a Russiagate hoax, a, a actual coup of our government, no problem. Get the man a book deal, make him rich. Until the right understands power and how it is used and wielded in this country is going to keep ending the same way. And one more point on this, which is that it's not enough just to say, oh, this got me so mad, I'm going to um, I'm going to change my voting behavior. If you want to change the way things work in this country, you have to organize. You have to be part of a crew that is going to visit households, to have conversations with them about how they're going to vote and about where they're going to vote. You have to be part of an actual canvassing project. It's just not enough anymore to say, oh, I'm so upset, I'm changing my vote, or I'm going to vote. What are you doing to get 10, 20, 50, 100, 1,000 other people to vote? And this this is the most important thing, Steve. You're exactly right. And that's why we are at Turning Point Action. We're doing the work. And people can go to tpaction.com and you can enlist yourself into this clipboard and tennis shoes army to do the work. Stephen, can you explain to me why the attorney general of Alabama, Steve Marshall, has not done any investigation of the Southern Poverty Law Center? Can you explain to me why not a single Republican attorney general or DA has done an investigation into coordinated Antifa activities? Why not a single Republican DA or attorney general has done a RICO investigation into BLM when they burned down the country and have obviously committed some form of fashion of charitable fraud and misleading donors? Can you explain to me why not a single Republican DA or attorney general has looked into the Biden crime family in regard to the hospital deals they did in Florida, the suspicious energy deal they did in Louisiana, which is blood red. Can you explain to me, Stephen, why our side is so afraid of ever even asking a question of investigating the outright criminal thuggery mafioso behavior of the Democrat Party? And we have to put up with this B-rate, overweight thug in downtown New York who's going to basically create a document falsifying charge against Trump. Why is our side so quick to appease and allow the destruction of the country? Why don't we do something about this? Well, so first of all, just the fact that this rigging is happening in broad daylight, that they can get away with it in broad daylight, tells you how far we've fallen in the country. Um, even Even in communist countries, they try to create the pretense of a legitimate charge. So they would, for example, they would charge you with espionage and they would make sure that they have the the evidence produced or fabricated in order to, to pursue that charge. Here, fake crime, don't identify even what it is. Don't even pretend the jury has to even agree on what the crime is. You can rig it all in broad daylight and just say, hey, look, we're rigging it and no one's going to do anything. No one's even going to stop us. So it just shows you, shows you how far we've fallen. To your other point, the average elected conservative legal office holder, so somebody who is uh, a district attorney, a state attorney, a state prosecutor, uh, an AG, um, or in other times would be a U.S. attorney or an assistant U.S. attorney or working at Maine Justice, they grew up and they came of age, and now they're in, the, in their prime of their career, internalizing the idea that to be a good conservative attorney is to worship at the altar of restraint, that your highest professional ideal is restraint in all things. Never fight back, never punch, never go on the attack, never, ever, ever put yourself in the center of attention, never seek the limelight, never be in the limelight, never, ever, ever. And that the proof and that the and that the the proof of your virtue will be in the praise of your enemies. That the highest good that you can strive towards is to earn the praise of your enemies. I need people to understand that this mindset is what people in the conservative movement were raised on for several generations. That is now the typical person who is in their prime career in these positions, Charlie. That is the explanation. That is it is a fully internalized, completely bought into ideology 
So it's not that they kind of want to do it, but don't figure out how. This is exactly they right. No, I, a virtue that they're exactly not doing. Exactly right. No, and I can reiterate it. So I I got really angry at an attorney general in a certain state. I'm not going to tell you who. And I called him up. I said, so when are you going to start indicting the left? He said, well, Charlie, unlike the left, we don't abuse government power and that we take pride in restraining our um, investigative authority. And I think that's why we have the moral high ground. I said, you're going to have a moral high ground in a concentration camp, pal. And he said, well, that, I think that's a real um, strong, emotionally charged statement. He said, the rule of law, this is what he said to me, the rule of law will ultimately always prevail. And if there is a crime by the Democrats that we can prove, then we'll investigate it like any other. But I do not want to steep down to their tactics. Stephen, what do you say to that sentiment? Well, just fundamentally flawed, just logically speaking, bad guys will always win if the bad guys are willing to use power to achieve evil ends, but the good guys aren't willing to use power to achieve just and virtuous ends. You know, when, you, when someone says something like, well, if, uh, if the left uh, breaks the law, we'll go after them. What they're saying is, is if by good luck and good fortune, it should fall into my lap, a perfect case completely stitched together with no work at all that's completely airtight and has no risk associated or involved whatsoever, and the defendant happens to be a leftist, well, then I would pursue it. But that's not how law enforcement works or has ever worked. The FBI woke up one morning and said, we're going to get Al Capone. The FBI woke up one morning and they said, we're going to take out these drug kingpins, back when the FBI did real, <laughs> real law enforcement work, right? The the Department of Defense woke up one morning and they said, we're going to take out ISIS or we're going to take out Al Qaeda. So when you're talking about foreign enemies or you're talking about domestic threats to freedom, it is the job of a law enforcement officer or a military officer to identify what the threats are and then to develop a strategy to, again, to achieve justice, to achieve a good, virtuous outcome. That's what it means to hold power. You're just running a tip line, just like, oh, waiting for the phone to ring with a really good tip when civilization is under attack. And, and if the, it's across the West, if the good guys aren't willing to use power to do good things, to achieve good outcomes, then yes, it's a cliche, but it has to be said that evil will triumph and evil will do evil things to innocent people. Yes. That's just how it works. That's and right. it's always and, and, and this, this is, here's the stakes. Our side is okay losing while feeling good about themselves. It's time for us to get over that, defend the country, and play to win. Stephen Miller does just that. Stephen, thank you so much. Thank you. Alina, thank you for calling in. Uh, I hear you're in the motorcade with President Trump. First, how is his spirits? What's going on in your reaction to this dark day, uh, this attempted legal assassination of our president? Yeah, it's, uh, they definitely tried, but they are not succeeding. That's for certain. If you look at the polls, if you look at what's happening with people pouring in the small money donors, I think it says everything that you need to know. Uh, their plan, frankly, will not work. It won't take him down. And if anything, the Trump team is only expanding and becoming more resilient. So uh, just explain to us then the process here. One very important technical detail, Alina, the sentencing on July 11th. What does that look like? The number one question people have is, is he going to be in a prison cell like Nicaragua, Uganda, <laughs> Haiti before the election? I don't have the answer to that question. I know it's the million dollar question everybody has. Um, Let's be clear about what I've always been saying as, as I've been sitting on trial from court to court to court since October here. We are in the state of New York that is by design, that is intentional, and the judges selected are by design and intentional. Judge Mershon just put his former CFO, who's 77 years old, back in prison for alleged perjury that I know my client, he didn't do that, and they scared the hell out of him. And it was so that he was unavailable, so that he was in jail and unavailable. It's unbelievable what this judge will do. I don't put anything past them, but um, we're prepared for everything. There's a few things to know. Number one, the sentencing, they take into account everything. For instance, President Trump's never done anything wrong, never had a crime against him, never had so much as a speeding ticket. And now we have this. Um, so, uh, you know, the, there's obviously probation officers involved and the judge, but it would be an incredible burden, frankly, on the system 
to have to put a former president in jail, not not to mention the tragedy and travesty of it all. I know you're sitting next, if you're near the president or sitting next to him, I want you to tell him from our audience, uh, we have his back, that we have more resolve than ever before. And this audience and millions and millions strong will walk on glass to vote over him, volunteer, chase ballots, register voters. And we want to do everything we can to get him back into the Oval Office by by any legal way that we can do that. Uh, Alina, I just want you to comment on this. We have Uh, two minutes remaining here. Can you comment on how Donald Trump's constitutional rights were violated? And is there an appeal route that will be explored? Absolutely. Uh, How weren't they violated would would be an easy way to answer it. I could start number one, First Amendment rights were violated, unconstitutional gag order. Then there's, you know, uh, several other constitutional rights that were violated, right to a fair, speedy trial. He didn't get a fair trial. He wasn't allowed to bring an expert in. We only had one witness who was immediately, uh, effectively sanctioned by the judge. The press had to leave the room because he was so outraged by one witness. Um, The trial evidentiary issues are another grounds for appeal. We will be filing an appeal. We will be taking every avenue that we need to take to make sure that the president gets back to the White House. That is the only new location he will be residing in. Uh, well, Alina, again, convey to our, the president um, that we have his back. Thank you for your leadership as well. And finally, Alina, can you Thank comment? You. The true jury is the American people. The true verdict will be in November. About 30 seconds, Alina, comment on that. Sure. Uh, I think the American people are speaking. I think the sleeping Americans have woken up. And I think that the November 5th, as the president say, is the real day. It's This is noise. And President Trump is resilient. But we have one shot, and that's in November to clean up this country and make sure we get back to the America that you and I know. Alina, thank you. And convey our, our message to the thank president. You, thank you. So I look, uh, this, thank you, this is, this is go time. Thank you. A lot of you say, how can I save the country? How can I save the country? You are right now living through an opportunity to do that. And they want you to, they want to disempower you. They want to disempower your ability to make a difference. So let me just go through the equation. Very simple. It's so simple, everybody. Step one, wear this MAGA hat this weekend. Show them you support him more. Step two, when people come up and give you a thumbs up, honk the horn, they come up to you and say, yes, we got to get him back in the White House. Are you registered to vote? We need millions of patriots asking other patriots that question this weekend. Are you registered to vote? Are you registered to vote? You would be shocked at how many sympathetic people are not registered to vote. Go to your local church, figure it out and do that there. How do you register them to vote? tpaction.com slash vote. That is tpaction.com slash vote. Boom, portal, register them to vote. Signed, sealed, delivered. Increase our ability to win.